Welcome to the Orchard Online. We're so glad you're with us this morning. Would you join us now as we worship our God together? You are not alone If you are lonely When you feel afraid You're not the only We are all the same In need of mercy To be forgiven and be free It's all you got to lean on But thank God it's all you need And all the people said amen Oh, and all the people said amen Give thanks to the Lord for His love never ends And all the people said amen If you're rich or poor, well it don't matter Weak or strong, you know love is what we're after We're all broken but we're all in this together God knows we stumble and fall and He so loved the world He sent His Son to save us all And all the people said Amen Whoa. And all the people said Amen Give thanks to the Lord for His love never ends And all the people said amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit who are torn apart. Blessed are the persecuted and the pure in heart. Blessed are the people hungry for another start. For theirs is the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And all the people said amen. Oh, and all the people said amen Give thanks to the Lord for His love never ends And all the people said amen Sing it again And all the people said amen Oh, and all the people said amen Give thanks to the Lord for His love never ends all the people said amen and all the people said amen come set your rule and reign in our hearts again increase in us we pray unveil why we're made come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls holy spirit come invade us now we are your church we need your power in us we seek your kingdom first we hunger and we thirst, refuse to waste our lives, for your our joy and prize, to see the captives' hearts release, the hurt, the sick, the poor at peace. We lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We are your church. Your kingdom here, we 
kingdom's power, reaching the near and far. No force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts. You made us for much more than this. Awake the kingdom seed in us. Fill us with the strength. church we are the whole on earth build your kingdom here let the darkness be show your mighty hand heal our streets and land set your church on There is an expression I have heard, a person dies the way they have lived. A person dies the way they have lived. If a person has lived with anger and resentment, they'll die that way. If a person has lived with hope and joy, they will die that way. Oh, I see this truth being lived out in the life of Jesus as he's dying. Because on the Roman cross, Jesus is dying. In the first of his final words, Jesus speaks, he lives with a concern for others and with a truth that just simply mystifies my mind. Jesus prays for the men who have crucified him, saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then to another person, a, a criminal next to him, who simply asks to be remembered when Jesus comes into his kingdom. Jesus says, today, you will be with me in paradise. The first of the two final words are spoken to strangers, people Jesus doesn't know. And the third of the first final words Jesus speaks are spoken to people he knows well, his mother. And a disciple described as the one whom Jesus loved, Mary, his mother. And a disciple who is as close to him as any of the other twelve. That's whom Jesus speaks to. In John chapter 19, let's pick it up in verse 23. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, a part for each soldier. They also took the tunic, which was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who gets it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that says, they divided my clothes among themselves and they cast lots for my clothing. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. Let's pray together. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be acceptable in your sight, Lord Jesus, our rock 
and our Redeemer. Amen. Jesus died the way he lived. Jesus lived with a concern for others. Jesus is dying, and he has a concern for others. So in these next few moments, I want to use our holy imagination and consider what we know about the relationship Jesus had with his mother, Mary, and the disciple described as the one Jesus loved. Let's begin with Mary. I'll start with an obvious statement. <laughs> Mary was with Jesus at his birth. Mary was with Jesus at his death. And the in-between years between his birth and his death are a bit mysterious, but we do have some insights into their relationship. You see, Mary is likely a young woman of 14 or 15 when she is told by the angel Gabriel, you have found favor with God, you will give birth to a son, you are to name him Jesus. And when Jesus was born, Mary wrapped him in swaddling clothes. I imagine she did the same thing when 40 days later, Mary and Joseph take Jesus to the Jerusalem temple to present him there. It was a rite of purification for Mary, and it was a rite where they redeemed Jesus back from God the Father. While they are there in the temple, we hear of a man named Simeon who has been waiting and watching for the Messiah. Here's how Luke, des Luke describes Simeon's words as he speaks to Mary. Then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, Indeed, this child is destined to, be, to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed, and a sword will pierce your own soul, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. From the very infancy of Jesus, Mary knows her firstborn son will be a source of incomparable joy and gut-wrenching heartbreak. I imagine Simeon's words lingered in Mary's mind long after he finished speaking them. Those words, a sword will pierce your own soul. I wonder if Simeon's words about Jesus, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed, ran through Mary's mind as she sees her son, Jesus, dying, stripped naked and staked to a Roman cross. I wonder how her heart must have been broken to see the soldiers playing a game of dice for her son's clothing. I wonder if Mary didn't long to go and wrap her son once again with clothing to cover his shame, to, to put cloth around him. But the cloth had been taken from him and won in a game. Mary sees her son pierced through with spikes in his hands and his feet. And I wonder if Mary is reminded of Simeon's words, your own soul will be pierced as well. Those words spoken by Simeon are now on full display before Mary and how her heart must have been breaking. Perhaps Mary's mind went back to another time Jesus was in the temple. This time Jesus was on the cusp of becoming an adult. He is 12 years old. Right around that time, 12, 13, 14, uh, young Jewish boys became Jewish men. And through that rite of passage, that child became a son of the law. But before Jesus goes through that rite of passage, he shows that he is a son of the Father. Remember the story? Mary and Joseph had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast. They've traveled there many times, and they've traveled there with their family from their hometown in Nazareth. The, peace, the, the, the feast of Passover was the sort of gathering where children were watched over by any number of different relatives. And Jesus is almost a man. I can imagine he was running with his other friends, those from Nazareth and from those he knew in Jerusalem. After the feast is over, a full day's journey towards home, and Joseph and Mary begin to look for Jesus. And when he can't be found among their relatives, they race back to Jerusalem, where Jesus is found in the temple, confounding the religious scholars with his insights and understanding of the law. Mary finds him and says, Son, why are you treating us like this? 
Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Jesus responds and says, why were you searching for me? Don't you know I had to be in my father's house? Luke summarizes the circumstances in Jesus and Mary's life with these words. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with people. Scripture says Mary kept all these things in her heart. The relationship between a mom and her son is certainly one of great interest and intrigue in psychology. A guy by the name of Freud had a few things to say about the mother-son relationship. In sports, who is often the last person given credit when a champion in men's sports is, be is being interviewed? Can, can you see the picture? A big athlete. He has won. He's the champion. He's got the trophy. And what does he say? Love you, Mom. Love you. you know, here's what we do know about the mom-son relationship. In most cultures, moms teach and model for their sons the emotional components of human relationships. And research shows the powerful connection between a mom and her son in terms of healthy emotional development. One study in a British university concluded the following. Research from the University of Reading says that children, especially boys who have insecure attachments to their mothers in the early years, have more behavior problems later in childhood. The article goes on to say, according to attachment theory, children with secure attachments expect and receive support and comfort from their caregivers. In contrast, children with insecure attachments have requests discouraged, rejected, or responded to inconsistently, which is thought to make them vulnerable to developing behavioral problems. From what we can glean from the scripture, Mary had a strong connection with Jesus. In fact, I hear a mother's concern in Mark chapter 3 when Jesus, his family, comes to take him home to Nazareth because they have concluded Jesus is out of his mind. Here's how Mark records it. Jesus entered a house and the crowd gathered again so that they were not even able to eat. When his family heard this, they set out to restrain him because they said, he is out of his mind. The ministry of Jesus was expanding at an exponential rate. Great crowds of people longed to hear his teaching and for many to have the touch of his healing. Mark tells us the family of Jesus came looking for him. And the context of Mark chapter 3 is that Jesus is in a dispute with the religious leaders from Jerusalem and other areas. And the leaders have concluded Jesus has a demon. He's not aligned with God the Father. He's aligned with the devil of hell. And so that's the context of the family of Jesus coming and saying of Jesus that he's out of his mind. Their conclusion is that Jesus has succumbed to mental illness. The word describes a person with a sort of ecstatic drive to the point of causing injury to themselves or other. It's the kind of person who is so singularly focused upon something that they forget anything that they must do, even eating. And sleeping. Now what part Mary had in this tense interchange between Jesus and his family is not fully revealed to us in Scripture. But I can imagine the kind of pain Mary must have felt in being between Jesus and his brothers. Perhaps as Mary is taken back to Jesus' words a year before about being the son of, of the Father and in the temple, he was about being in the Father's presence. Here in Mark, years later, Jesus is about the Father's preaching. And Jesus' understanding of family far exceeded Mary and his siblings. A greater connection is, is expressed in the ministry and the teachings of Jesus. And maybe Mary was taken aback by the words of Jesus. Who is my mother, my brothers and sisters? His answer, those who do the will of my Father in heaven. You see, one of the greatest and most difficult parenting milestones faced by moms and dads is releasing a child into their own pursuit, their own passions, their own path. And that milestone can be one of great rejoicing when a child chooses a path 
in a direction that the parents agree with. And the milestone can be one of utter heartbreak when a child chooses a path and a purpose other than what the parents want for them. And I see some of that in Mary's dilemma as she sees her son set out on a path by his heavenly father, but a path that Mary knows will take Jesus to the cross. And Mary's, how Mary's heart must have been crushed as Jesus tells his closest followers that the father, that he would find his way to Calvary, to the cross. From that cross, Jesus speaks to his mother. John records Jesus' final words and a lasting promise. All four of the Gospels tell the story of Jesus, that there was a group of women there. Mary is among them. John identifies them as these women. Jesus standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Jesus sees Mary. Woman, here is your son. And Jesus is not referring to himself, but to the disciple whom he loved. You see, Jesus died the way he lived, being concerned and looking out for others. This time it was his mother. Jesus, the firstborn, fulfills the Jewish custom to be the one taking care of his parent. You see, in Jesus' larger family, the family of his heavenly father, one of his spiritual brothers would take care of Mary. And eventually we know that Jesus' blood brothers, they became followers of him. They moved from being antagonists against Jesus to becoming followers of him, even leaders in the early church. But his earthly brothers are nowhere to be found at the time of his death. Only one man is among the women who are standing at the cross. John identifies him as the disciple Jesus loved. Now, students of the scripture have long debated who this disciple is. Recent scholarship has suggested that the disciple Jesus loved was actually a Jewish priest who had connections to the high priest. And there's something to be said for that. But without question, there are some mysterious, intriguing ideas about who this disciple is. But I'm going to stick with what church tradition has said, going all the way back to the early church fathers. They believe the reference to the disciple whom Jesus loved is in fact John the Apostle. John had been recruited by Jesus. He's one of the first four recruits. Again, in Matthew chapter 4, the scripture says it this way, going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, preparing their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. You see, John is believed to be the youngest of the disciples called by Jesus. And along with his brother James and Simon Peter, John is one of the three in the inner circle of the leaders in Jesus' ministry. And that connection between John and Jesus grew over the years in Jesus' public ministry. In fact, there's some evidence that John and James are actually cousins of Jesus. So they may have known here for quite some time. That, in fact, might be behind the request from James and John to be seated at the right and left hand of Jesus when he comes into his kingdom. In, in other words, James and John play the family card with Jesus. But Jesus reminds them that in his father's kingdom, those seats have been assigned to others. And now all John can see as he looks upon Jesus, not two seats of glory, but two criminals next to him. You see, any, any thought of reigning with Jesus seems to have disappeared into a mix of stark reality for what John sees before him in that instance. John had seen Jesus in a very different way at another time. And I imagine for a moment he longed to see Jesus again in glory, but before his very eyes now, he sees Jesus dying. When John had seen Jesus in his glory, we call it the Mount of Transfiguration. The Gospel writers record it this way. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves to be alone. He was transfigured in front of them. 
and his clothes became dazzling, extremely white as no launderer on earth could whiten them. John, along with Peter and James, is given the privilege of seeing the glory of Jesus that has been hidden by the incarnation. To see Jesus in his heavenly glory must have been burned into John's mind as he beheld the radiance of Jesus. In fact, Mark makes a point of mentioning how the clothes of Jesus appeared at the transfiguration. His clothes became dazzling, extremely white as no launderer on earth could whiten them. What a stark contrast to what John is seeing right now. Jesus is stripped naked, his body covered with his own blood, and darkness covers the ground around John and the woman standing at the cross. Where had the glory of Jesus gone? Yet, of the four gospel writers, John alone associates the death of Jesus with the glory of God. John came to understand that even the brutality of the cross could not erase this truth. The cross brings the children of God into the glory of God. John's gospels and his other writings seem to be more readily willing to see the mystery and the actions and the words of Jesus. And I wonder if John didn't, didn't learn that value of mystery from the words that he heard, not just at the cross, but the night before. J John is at the table with Jesus. John chapter 13 describes it this way. One of his disciples, the one Jesus loved, was reclining close behind him. Jesus is there at the Last Supper. Picture it in your mind. Uh, behind him is John. And in the other place of honor, closest to Jesus, is Judas. John is behind him. Judas is in front of him. Jesus says to all the disciples there that one of the disciples will betray him. So, so Peter immediately tries to get John's attention. Ask him who it is. Ask him who it is. And John hears Jesus say, it is the one to whom I give this piece of bread after I have dipped it in the dish. He hands it to Judas. John's witnessing it, right? And he hears Jesus say to Judas, what you're about to do, do quickly. Yet the scripture says the other disciples don't understand what Jesus has said to Judas. Perhaps the sheer terror of one of them becoming a traitor completely shrouds their minds and deafens their ears to what Jesus was saying. One of them will be instrumental in the arrest of Jesus. But perhaps some time of reflection allowed John to connect the dots and thoughts that Jesus was on the cross because he chose to be there. Jesus had orchestrated his own crucifixion for the greater good of redeeming the children of God. And the one Jesus loved embraced the mystery of the Son of Man coming not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for humanity. Without a question, John learned that from the way Jesus lived and died that serving others was the path that Jesus walked. So when Jesus says to the disciple he loved, here is your mother, John took her into his home as his very own family member. Hear the words of Jesus once again from the cross. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. And although we'd have no scripture to lean upon, tradition tells us that Mary lived in a home built by John in the city of Ephesus, where he had established a church of Jesus. And there in Ephesus, Mary died. So what will we take away? from these words spoken from Jesus as he was dying. Jesus died the way he lived. Jesus died the way he lived. He lived to serve others and build a community of people connected to his Father. So I invite you, be a part of the community. Be a part of the family of God. And Jesus, well known by Mary and John, makes those connections for us so that we receive care and love and encouragement from our family in Christ. Pray with me. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the story of Mary and John. 
we see the brutality of the cross. And yet because you died the way you lived, still we see your purpose and what you accomplished there as you gave them one to the other so as to establish a relationship that kept them together, a mother and a son, for many, many years. Jesus, we thank you. Let us be said of us that we are people who died the way they lived, with joy, with hope, looking and following after you. And together, God's people said, Watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. As we finish up this day, two announcements, two quick announcements. One being that if you haven't signed up for a supper club yet, what are you waiting for? I invite you, go to our webpage, orchardnh.org, and sign up for a supper club. What a great way to connect with other followers of Jesus and the life of our church. Sign up. You'll be contacted by the host. They'll let you know when they're planning to share that meal. 
In fact, you sign up for the time, so you already know. But sign up. Be in the Supper Club. And the second one is this. If you find in your circumstance right now that you're having a hard time paying for the heating in your home, oil, gas, electricity, whatever it is, would you contact me? We have a person in a family in the life of our church who has given a generous gift specifically to help folks who are struggling to keep their home heated. You let me know. We'll do what we can to help you. For every one of us, though, let us go out knowing that Jesus has called us into his family. We're, we're kin to each other. We're family together. Let's show it by the way we live. Together, God's people said, Amen. Amen.